Great. Uh, thank you all. Um, my name is Jennings Anderson. I'm a PhD candidate in computer science at the University of Colorado Boulder. I've been doing OSM data analysis research for a number of years now, uh, and it's since become the topic of my dissertation. So let me first motivate uh, this talk with a bit of my own research trajectory. So I was first introduced uh, to OSM through studying disaster mapping, specifically the response to the 2010 Haiti earthquake. Uh, in January 2010, nearly 500 volunteers created the most detailed digital map of Haiti in existence by tracing satellite uh, imagery on OSM. Uh, this then went on to inspire uh, this now global form of, of disaster of humanitarian response. Uh, three years later, Typhoon Yolanda struck the Philippines. This animation shows the work of now about 1,500 volunteers tracing buildings from satellite imagery. These data were used for damage assessment and recovery. And then in April 2015, about 8,000 volunteers responded to the Nepal earthquake by tracing thousands of kilometers of roads and hundreds of thousands of buildings. You can see the mountainous geography reflected by the geometry of the roads uh, being traced here. These are roads to villages uh, and buildings within that are literally being put on the map for the first time. So this was the largest uh, rapid response disaster mapping event in history. So in researching these events, it quickly became obvious that OSM is much more than a map. The current map is the aggregate product of billions of edits across millions of objects performed by hundreds of thousands of contributors since 2004. So how do we better understand the nuances of the evolution of the map and the community? For one, the historical context of different regions in OSM is critical to understand. These are graphs showing the daily editing activity for four different countries. Each one tells a distinctly different story about the daily editing, uh, daily activity and the community growth. The number of daily users is represented by the red dots, the scale for which is on the right of each graph, and the blue lines uh, represent the daily activity, the scale is on the left side. Uh, do note that these scales are uh, dramatically different uh, given the relative editing activity. Uh, comparing raw numbers doesn't really work here, but look at the, the shape of these distributions. So, Germany grew a very active OSM community quickly and has continued uh, to edit consistently. Uh, in contrast, the bulk of mapping in the United States was a data import in 2007, 2008, and the community has consistently grown since then, but that initial import greatly skews any relative activity um, since. For both Haiti and Nepal, we see a pronounced spike in both editing activity and the number of users during their respective disaster mapping events. These varying histories are essential to consider when looking at the map as it exists today. The activity surrounding the mapping is going to have implications for how the data was contributed. The daily work of a paid mapper, for example, is likely detail-oriented, high-quality edits aimed at increasing coverage and completeness. A local mapping party is going to provide a lot of localized, highly detailed information about an area, while a disaster mapping event is going to involve a lot of remote tracing, little local knowledge, and a lot of new mappers. So referring back to the histories of Nepal and the US, the map has grown through very different contexts. Again, recall the scales are different, but it's the shape of the distribution. So in the US, we first see the road import, and then we have the subsequent spikes as we have uh, different imports across various cities. A lot of these are the building imports. Um, however, there's been this kind of consistent community growth since the beginning. Uh, and compared to Nepal, where you do have an active, uh, an active local community, um, and then that activity is just totally dwarfed by the uh, response to the earthquake. The next piece to consider here is contributor context. Who are the contributors and what type of experience do they have? How long have they been active on the platform? Moreover, what's a more descriptive indicator of experience? Days active or raw number of edits? Uh, and then what about the type of expertise that users have? So consider the following example, uh, contributor editing profile. As this user makes more edits, their total kilometers of roads, uh, road edits increases, but the number of buildings stays the same. Um, this user then would have specific kind of road editing expertise. Alternatively, someone who primarily focuses on buildings would look more like that. A recent study of ours shows that many new mappers tend to focus on specific object types, but as they become more experienced with the platform, we'll lose this affinity for roads or buildings. Uh, most power contributors don't have any object preference, they edit everything. 
So beyond contextualizing the editing histories of the map and the contributors, we need to qualify exactly what it is that we're measuring. Here I make the distinction between questions and the indicators that can be measured relating to the question. Take this seemingly simple question, for example, how active is the mapping community in New York City? As proposed, this question is not possible to simply measure. There is no single activity attribute in the database that we can query. However, here are some various measurable metrics across New York City. Over 1,800 users have ever edited in New York City. In winter 2017, there were about 20 users editing per square kilometer in the city. So if we break this question down, each of the following become indicators of community activity. Uh, each of these are quantifiable attributes in the database. Only by explicitly identifying the indicators being measured and how they relate to the larger questions can we go on to perform robust reproducible analysis. Beyond questions and indicators, what's the best format from which we can measure uh, these attributes? I'm personally a huge fan of OSM QA tiles. These are vector tiles with the majority of OSM object metadata included per object. Is that better? Oh, now it's working. Okay. <laughs> so, however, uh, these tiles don't show history very well. Tiles only contain the latest version of an object, so history is not currently tracked. That said, annual snapshots were made available, uh, separate data sets that showed what the map looked like on the first uh, of each year for the last decade. So this animation shows the density of edits from 2005 to 2016 in the US uh, computed using these snapshots. However, I found the community is far too active for annual snapshots to capture the full story. There's too much editing activity happening throughout the year that doesn't get counted. In some urban areas, as much as 80% of the editing activity is effectively masked by any edits that happen to occur at the end of the year when the snapshot's made. Uh, to address this problem, I created quarterly snapshots for analysis. Um, doesn't include the full editing history, but you have four times more granularity. So here's an example of those quarterly snapshots in my hometown, Boulder. Uh, the top row shows the growth of the road network over the second half of 2007 and the beginning of 2008. Uh, this shows the importance of quarterly resolution to see that actual growth. The bottom row shows then the densification of the map as it filled in uh, over the last six years. So these quarterly snapshots might give us better resolution than the annual snapshots, but it primarily shows growth over time, requiring time series analysis. Um, and it makes it then difficult to know who did what work when. So all of this is just to say that OSM data analysis is nuanced, difficult, and full of uncertainty. There are many ways we can analyze the data, and we do. Furthermore, there's a need to expand this conversation. Uh, this track is, is part of that. Uh, this figure go shows the growth in research articles as indexed by Google Scholar uh, over the past eight years. These numbers show article per year uh, non-cumulative. Uh, just for that search term, OpenStreetMap data analysis. Uh, with more research attention has come a variety of, pro of approaches to the data. So each of these different approaches and combinations of tools makes the reproducibility, validity, and rigor difficult to maintain and evaluate. Okay, so what is contributor-centric, as the title of the talk is? Um, so I consider a contributor-centric approach to reimagine OSM data analysis all the way down the stack by creating new data sets specifically formatted to unveil these rich histories of the objects on the map and allow researchers to define and describe a set of measurable indicators from the data to encourage more reproducible analysis. We need to remember that the map is not a single static rendering of geospatial data, but instead a dynamic and growing community of contributors that maintains an open map of the world. In short, OSM is more than a single map, so it needs to be analyzed in multiple dimensions uh, as more than a map. And I hope this approach will provide more detail uh, to enable better data quality assessment and community analysis, ultimately opening up more research opportunities around OSM. Extrapolating the number of articles already present on Google Scholar for 2018, we're on track to continue growing at this rate. So uh, I say here, the data scientists are coming. It's important that the analysis tools available to these new researchers can expose the expansive history of the map to help them see, too, that OSM is more than just a map, and the history is imperative to understand for complete and accurate analysis. So now I'll transition into my kind of current approach to, to try to solve this problem. Um, the first step is to make sure we have all the information we need to reconstruct the development of the map. For this, uh, currently use the full uh, planet history file. 
So at the edit level here, we're most interested in what changed on the map instead of what's on the map. Also, and fortunately, the number of historical OSM data sources is growing. Uh, projects like OSM Mesa and Awesome from Heidelberg uh, provide new ways to process and analyze historical data. So I see this as a great time to adopt and standardize specific OSM data analysis language and schemas to represent change in the map. Uh, if we're all measuring the same indicators, we can then better share and interpret our results. The crux of this work is then to represent the data in a familiar, usable form while also tracking this historical information. For this, I'm currently extending a GeoJSON OSM data model. So here's a GeoJSON representation of the OSM object for the pedestrian path uh, out front of the university. Um, this is a lossless conversion from the OSM data model with all the attributes and metadata. And today, I'm adding this history attribute. The history property contains a list of all previous edits to the object. Instead of just recording the tags and attributes of each version, it also computes and stores the differences between the versions. In this example, we see that when version one was created, it was marked as area yes, given a name, and then three other tags. Later on, version six and seven added the surface equals paving stones and lit equals yes tags. For this small connector road, you can see instances of attributes being deleted and modified. Uh, we can see that three different users were involved in naming this road. The first user deleted the name uh, Viale Argon, and then two months later added the name Via Corelli. A second user modified the attribute to its current name nine days later, and then a month after that, a third user came in, changed capitalization to maintain consistency. Note that each version here also includes both a valid since and valid until timestamp. Uh, this enables us to easily filter by time to render features uh, as they existed at any point. So this is the first step for generating historical geometries. Computing historical geometries is a very difficult problem given the node-way relation topology of OSM data. Uh, but why is this important? Consider these new buildings added to the map in the week following the 2015 Nepal earthquake. Let's look closer. Keep an eye on these buildings. And here's that same area 10 days later. Notice that these buildings are now more square. So in the database, however, the buildings are all still recorded as version equals one. This is because the reference node was moved, but no change occurred to the metadata of the building object. Uh, most current tools don't track these geometry-only changes. I make this point because this particular edit is especially important to count. These changes to geometry represent a form of explicit data validation. A second user here is correcting the data of a previous user. And more importantly, there's also this implicit map validation occurring here as well. All of those buildings between the edited buildings are effectively uh, being deemed good or passing quality uh, by this uh, validator. So tracking these types of edits has huge implications for quality analysis and validation on the map. So to track these intermediate changes, we can then add an attribute, the minor version. Uh, minor versions are written into the object's history alongside major versions and gives credit where credit is due to the contributor who adjusts the geometry. So uh, with all the incremental geometry changes recorded and valid timestamps uh, in the object's metadata, we can really dig into the history of what the map looked like at any given second throughout history. This animation shows buildings and roads in Alameda, California. Uh, each side of this map simply queries for objects with the appropriate valid since and valid until timestamps uh, corresponding to the time slider above. So how does this all come together? I'm gonna get technical for a second here. Uh, there's a tool that Lucas Martinelli and I started developing that can do all of this from the historical planet file with fairly decent performance. It's called the OSM Wayback Utility, a reference to a previous OSM project, the OSM Wayback Machine, uh, developed years ago by Sajad and Sanjay. So it works like this. Uh, and I'll walk through these four steps briefly. Uh, OSM Wayback first populates a RocksDB index from an OSM history file. There are separate column families for each type of OSM element and additional node locations column for geometry reconstruction. RocksDB is an on-disk uh, key value storage system developed by Facebook. The result is an index with super fast lookups based on object IDs. And most importantly, uh, this can run on one machine and is not computationally in uh, intensive, uh, only disk space intensive. 
So next, uh, with the stream of OSM objects, uh, such as the product of the Osmium export tool, uh, we then look up all previous versions of an object. The tool computes the diffs between each version and records both the differences and editing metadata for who made the changes and when. This information then becomes that additional history property. If we're concerned about historical geometries, the current utility can account for that as well and performs a lookup of all nodes ever associated with a particular OSM object. It does take a bit longer to perform this lookup, um, but at no point does the utility hold a location index in memory, so again, it can be run on smaller machines. Uh, the output of this step is a much larger JSON object with the list of all node locations ever possibly associated and their edit metadata. And then finally, we compute the historical geometries per version and minor version, augmenting that history array to include minor versions in the appropriate order. This ensures that all users ever associated with this object are represented in the object's history. Uh, computing minor versions can require calculating a massive cross product. Uh, this can be a bottleneck in processing, but can easily uh, be scaled through parallelization if needed. So what gets produced? Uh, the new JSON objects have substantially more information embedded in them. These extra attributes uh, can be written out as is, uh, with or without geometries for the most human readable output, um, or they can be encoded as topo JSON to save space. So topo JSON will remove the redundancies and all the historical geometries. Uh, since topo JSON encodes each point once and then references uh, single points across multiple features, we can encode many historical versions of an object uh, and yet only record the coordinates once. So the resulting <laughs> GeoJSON formatted OSM objects with embedded topo JSON history uh, can be fed into Tippy Canoe to create historical vector tiles. The result is a single uh, MB tiles file, which is really just a SQLite database that can be easily shared and stored without, many, without uh, any major infrastructure. So rendered at Zoom 15, uh, these are fairly compact and even renderable tiles, as shown. Uh, here's Milan. Um, and they're ideal for feeding into a processing uh, utility like TileReduce for parallelized analysis. There's definitely limitations of this approach to historical OSM data management. Uh, it's best for buildings, roads, points of interest. Uh, large polygons that span multiple tiles can certainly cause problems. Um, and relations that are really multi-polygons can be handled, as long as Osmium can handle them. Uh, but relations without inherent geometric representation, such as turn restrictions, um, are more difficult to handle. So uh, let's talk about results for like a minute and a half. Um, I ran a few different numbers uh, for the map in Milan just to kind of uh, try a couple things here. Uh, I should note that uh, once I was able to, once I had the history extract from Milan, um, I could do all the rest of the utility running uh, locally. Um, no servers, no cloud infrastructure uh, to maintain. Um, okay, so first I searched for edits to buildings where the attribute building equals yes had been updated. Um, and so here's the usernames of the top building editors in Milan who modified this particular building tag, uh, adding valuable local knowledge to the map. Is anyone in this room? No? Okay. Uh, here's a list of the top users by kilometers of roads they've ed they, uh, with which they've added the name tag uh, to a highway tag. Um, the map in the back shows these ways kind of colored by user. Um, I always like searching for the name tag when, it's, when that's an attribute that's been added uh, because it hints towards local knowledge being put on the map. Here's a rendering of polygons in Milan that have been edited then by multiple different users. Uh, the opacity reflects the number of users. I'm not entirely sure how useful this is um, and what it's showing, uh, but there are a few outliers, uh, like some random buildings have been edited a lot, um, so there could be something interesting there uh, to explore further. Uh, I talked about minor versions of geometries. Here's a graph of when they occur in Milan. Um, I'm really curious if these spikes then correspond to the release of new imagery. Um, and if we can see the effect that new imagery then has on the map um, as people get better imagery and they're changing the, um, changing the geometries of these objects. Um, I know way better than to show a hairball network. Uh, they're hard to interpret, uh, so apologies to any network scientists in the room. Uh, what you see here, though, is the directed editing uh, network for objects in Milan. The vertices are sized by out degree, meaning that the larger vertices have edited the work of more different users. Um, but if we run a community detection algorithm, uh, we actually see the split in the data. 
So I haven't had a chance to dig into this yet, um, but I wonder if these two communities break down across specific object types in OSM. Uh, so perhaps we're seeing like the uh, editing networks of building mappers versus like highway mappers in the area. Um, not sure, I'm excited to dig into that. So where to from here? Um, our vector tile is a good approach. With a new vector tile spec in the works, perhaps there's room for a larger discussion um, about extraneous metadata such as history. Um, and yeah, excited to uh, talk about other historical data approaches. Uh, perhaps the schema or one similar can be incorporated to better standardize how we uh, do some of this analysis. Uh, with that, huge thank you to all my mentors, colleagues, and collaborators across academia and industry. I've known this for a few years now, and none of this work would be possible uh, without these wonderful people, organizations, uh, the tools and communities that they built and foster. Uh, thank you very much for the exciting presentation. Um, I, I think it's time for uh, five minutes question time, so you can raise your hand and um, we can bring the mic to you. Jennings, this is hyper fascinating. Um, so, how how would we translate this back to um, mappers who want to perhaps meet others? Like, how could you how could you translate this back to kind of yeah, how people kind of connect to each other? So, how can kind of regular mappers use this in a meaningful way? Do you see that? Yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot to be done, and this kind of a larger discussion um, among the talks today of like communicating this back to the to the community. Um, I'm hoping that approaches like this can kind of standardize how we do some of these analyses and make that easier language to understand um, in such a way that it could be shared. Um, I mean, just sharing, sharing the results of such these analyses, uh, diary posts, et cetera, um, and maybe finding ways to, to incorporate more users into it. Um, I think this is a really important topic, and, I ha and I'm not entirely sure what the best route is, but i um, excited to talk more about that. Yeah. This is just a comment. It's looked absolutely brilliant. Please do something like this for Tanzania. Uh, I would say, please do this for every country <laughs> in every region. It's it's something I think everyone in the community struggles with. It's it's very hard to just get the number of I don't know what's going on um, of of just how many people are active. What are they doing? How uh, is our road network still growing? Is is it being edited? Stuff like that. I, it's a huge amount of work to do this yourself for your own country and then some people do it and then they give up because it's too much work. Uh, so if we have a platform we can build upon, it would be way easier. So, cool. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, maybe just a technical question. How big does the output of this get for the full planet? Because if you store all the minor versions, it obviously has to be quite large. Uh, yeah, uh, still under a terabyte. Okay. <laughs> the, the size of the uh, final uh, historical vector tile um, is, sorry, so that's the JSON output is under a terabyte. Uh, the size of the historical vector tile actually corresponds pretty well to the size of the history uh, OSM PBF. Um, so, yeah, there's, and, and that can be improved with different compression. Um, right now it's just a lot of JSON and I'm sure there's some binary compressions we could improve that with. <laughs> 